How are you guys doing? Man, it's so good to be with you. Um, So glad you're here. If you're new, we we just really want to emphasize this is a place of belonging, and you can belong before you believe, as you believe, Um, but we're just so grateful that you're here, Um, and we really believe everyone's on a spiritual journey. It's not so important as where you've been or even where you're at. The most important thing is where you're headed. And we just want to help you in this journey track. You guys probably saw that, our journey track classes. Um, I'm biased about this uh, track. I think it's one of the best things we do, not just because I get to teach uh, part of it, but because we see so much transformation. And as you saw in the video, like uh, we have people that don't yet know Christ and are exploring faith. And we have people who have been Christians for a long time. And we see so much transformation, no matter what stage of life or season you're in. And uh, I just want to encourage you to come. We have people who uh, root for the Cougars and the Huskies both go to this class. And some of them walk out friends. It's an amazing deal. I want to encourage you to come. And I'd love to get to meet you and know your your story. Um, uh, the other thing I wanted to, to mention uh, before we, we jump into the, uh, the talk today is we've been doing 21 days of prayer. Like we're part of doing a series, it's called Called to Compassion, but the first chapter of it's been 21 days of prayer, three weeks where we as a community are practicing prayer. And prayer is simply talking with God, not talking at God. And, and anyone can pray. Um, in a quiet of your mind you can pray out loud and we just wanted to grow and maybe this is your first Sunday here this is the last week of the 21 days but we still have some of these booklets grab it as a resource to grow in prayer and even if you're going to use it the next 21 days that's great Um, and so I wanted to make sure you had this and uh, if you're a parent you have kids or you're you know you're a step parent and you've got like kids that you bring here whatever it might be or a nephews and nieces if you know any kids that are in our kids program I want you to be aware of something really special um, that you might not be aware of every week the kids are learning uh, about Jesus some of you guys are like okay that's good very basic, but I'm very glad. Every week they're learning about Jesus. They're learning um, in different ways, too. We, we really try to um, teach different learning uh, uh, styles, whether it's more tactile, it's audio, it's visual. Like The kids are learning about Jesus, and every week we send home um, a resource tool for you to disciple your kids. We have a fantastic leader in that area. Her name's Samantha Wilbur. Uh, she's our kids director, and she makes sure that every week you have a craft or a memory verse, something to help disciple your kids. Every week, Novella, my little daughter at six years old, will tell me what she learned, and we'll actually be able to talk about stories from Jesus and how she's learning about him and how she's learning to love other people. She even tells me how, what I should tell the big adults in big church about it's awesome so I just wanted you to know take advantage of that resource um, um, because we want to partner with you in discipling your kids Uh, with that said shall we pray together let's do it Heavenly Father I'm just so grateful for today so grateful that we get to spend time together would you Lord uh, clear any of the distractions any of the things that have been clouding our minds and our hearts and today would you speak to us each individually, Lord. So when we walk out of here, Lord, there's, there's something that, that's, that's transformative. And God, would you also send us out of here united one in heart, that this is a family. This is a, this is a spiritual family that you want to do, uh, that you want to transform and work with. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. In, this, in the 21 days of prayer, we've talked about two different prayers up to this point. The first one was a, a learning to have a prayer life of confession, which, you know, uh, if you're a police officer, sounds really awesome. Or if you're Catholic, you might have different views on what confession is. But the way we understand or, or teach confession is really simply living a life honestly before God, others, and ourselves. And everybody here is living life with themselves with others and some people here are living life with God but not everyone lives honestly in those three areas the life of honesty I think is something that I think many of us want and learning to pray Lord search me and guide me that's a big prayer the second prayer we talked about last week is a prayer of transformation Lord transform me change me does anybody here have areas of their life they want transformed and changed few of us I know I do and God the cool thing about God is he's he transforms us but he's also transforming us and that like none of us are at where we want to be but we're not where we were 
But we are where we are, and God accepts us where we are. And, and Jesus taught this reality. Um, if we want to live a transformed life, one of the fundamental, foundational truths is that we are, uh, Jesus taught it this way, we are to be baptized or immersed into the God life. Father, Son, and Spirit. Go and make disciples, baptizing them in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And last week we learned this reality is so important that we are loved by the Father, we are led by the Spirit, learning to be loved like Jesus. Now, it, it, it's simple but complex, and the, and the fact that we are loved by the Father breaks down, I think, in some really important ways. Um, I, I had my daughter draw this up, if, and I'm just going to remind us, uh, most of us are living life in, a, in, a, in the world, and when we are loved by the Father, uh, there's a new reality that breaks, and most of us live in a world where there, we draw lines through people. Um, lines get drawn through people, and, and, and the world's way of loving often says, uh, I accept this aspect of you, these things, and these ways of living, and these aspects of your personality. I love these and accept these, but these aspects of you that I don't like, I reject. And so we live in a world that draws lines through people and is a, a conditional love. I will love you if, I will accept you if, but God loves differently than us. His is a perfect kind of love, and he draws the circle around all of us, the whole you, the whole me, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and says, I love you. I don't love some future version of yourself or some past better version of yourself. I love you as you are, as you walked in this building today. Every moment, every step of your life, God couldn't love you more in the future or um, less in the past. He loves you as much as he loves you, couldn't love you more than he loves you right now. And one of the biggest, I, I would say, transformative moments in a human's life when they realize that they are not just a human learning to be spiritual, but that you and I are eternal spiritual beings now learning to be human. One of the most important moments is when we realize that change most fundamentally happens when we accept God's acceptance of us. You are already loved and accepted by the Father. Will you accept that love, turn toward that love, or live a life where we're drawing lines. It's also true that in our world we draw lines not just through people, but between people. Um, based on the politics, based on religion, based on gender, based on age, based on all kinds of things. Uh, and we draw lines that say who's in and who's out. Or from this perspective, who's in and who's out. And depending on which group you're in, there's, there's a line that says this is the good people and these are the bad people. And this is how our world operates, this very conditional love um, kind of way. And God loved the whole world and drew a circle around the whole world, the good, the bad, and the ugly. God loves us. And when we respond to this love, guess what happens? God begins changing us from the inside out. Amen? Now, God doesn't just leave us where he finds us in brokenness and blessing. He doesn't just leave us uh, with the, the issues and the problems and the habits and the things that we struggle with. He, uh, he leads us by his spirit. We're loved by the Father and led by the Spirit. That means that God is leading us by his spirit to become who we were born to be. That you have gifts and a future and skills and a calling in your life that God wants you to live into um, and here's the most beautiful part. God is not only leading you to become who you're born to be, but he's leading you to become who you could never be without him. We need God. So this isn't like a self-improvement project on your own. God is the one by his spirit, like changing you and me. And I think that's one of the most like, encouraging things. It's not like a lone, uh, you know, isolated project. God is at work by his spirit leading you and me, um, and, and learning to follow God's leading is one of the challenges, but also one of the joys of Christian faith, and, and the Spirit of God is always leading us. Here's how, one of the ways we know it's the Spirit, is he's always leading us to be more like Jesus. We're learning to be love like Jesus. That means that we're failing forward. That means that hopefully we're, when we're failing, we're trusting in God's love. Um, it, when my, um, my son right now is, is being potty trained and he's in this process of learning to use the toilet on his own. 
I've drawn a circle around my son. I love him to death. But we're trying to lead him to be an adult. How many parents are out there love it as your kids learn to be potty trained? All right? Like, it's, you know, it's great, but when he's 21, I want this problem to be over. <laughs> if he has a few mistakes here and there, we'll help him along the way. And, you know, God's like that with us. He wants us to learn. He wants us to grow. He wants us to go in a, in a trajectory. And the Spirit is leading us and wanting us to grow. God deals with our mistakes and our accidents along the way. But, but this means that our faith is fundamentally Jesus-shaped, fundamentally Jesus-centered. And if we're moving in a direction that doesn't look like Jesus, I think there's a fair assumption that it's probably a way that we should turn from. We need to turn toward looking and shaping our life like Jesus. Amen? There is, there is no other teacher... There's no other leader that I know that has changed more lives than the teachings and the way of Jesus. Over the history, there has, never, there has been no more transformative teaching and way than the way of Jesus. And on top of that, there's no other religion or philo- philosophy with founders that lived and died what they taught, that, that actually died Um, because they loved their disciples and even the enemies that were killing them. Jesus said, Father, forgive his enemies, for they know not what they do. There's no other leader who founded a religion or philosophy like Jesus who actually died because he loved his disciples, died for them. It's one of the most amazing uh, aspects of Jesus. Now, what I want to talk to you guys about today is we've talked two weeks about Uh, living honestly before God and being transformed by God. So personal transformation. Now what I want to talk to you guys about is that God has a plan for your life and my life. God wants to use our lives to, to transform our world. That God cares about transforming individuals and communities. How many of you guys believe that God wants to transform people, individuals? Okay, a few of us, about 60%. Awesome. We're doing pretty good. That's way better than the first service. They're like one person. They're not very transformed or they didn't have their coffee. I don't know. How many of you guys believe that God wants to transform our communities and our cities? Do you think that God has our... Come on now. Yeah. Yeah, there we go. We got some people there. Okay, what I want to talk... about What does that look like? What does a transformed city community look like? And, how, and what is the shape of it? How does that, and how are we part of that? What does that look like? I, simply, if I could put today in one question is, what does God want the communities in Pierce County to look like? Ording, Bonnie Lake, um, Tacoma, um, Puyallup, Sumner, wherever you are, your neighbor, what does God want that to look like? And I, you know, I owe a lot of my thinking to some great thinkers and some great people that have been in my life. Um, I, there's even people here that have shaped my thinking, my heart on this. And, um, and I, I just am very thankful for uh, the community that I've been able to learn from. And, and you guys might not know it, but we actually have a leadership community in this church. And this community came together in, I think it was June. And we started asking this question together. And so some of what we're going to be talking about has been developed from leaders within this church in community. And so I just want to let you guys know that, that I am so grateful to have a community that learns together and wants to capture a vision together. Now, what, what does a transformed community look like? Okay, I got a little bit of time, not much, but I'm going to give you 60 seconds to turn and talk to somebody, just for 60 seconds. So if you hate it, it's only 60 seconds. If you love it, it's only 60 seconds. Um, you, you have a minute. Talk with the person next to you, and what are two things that you think are essential to a transformed community, a community that is flourishing with God? Okay, ready, set, go. <laughs>
30 seconds. If you've done all the talking, let someone else talk. All right, what do we discover? What do we discover? What are some important elements of a flourishing community? Hope, yeah, that's probably fairly important. I would be remiss, I probably should have said this earlier. For me, it would require to ha- uh, have Sarah Bedley in a part of, because, and she's watching online today, so I'm, I need to make sure my wife, I need you, part of this community. Um, love you, Sarah. Got to get them however you can. <laughs> um, back there, someone raised their hand. Patrick. Yeah, we compassion. Compassion. Yeah. We live in a competitive, um, op- often contemptuous culture that has contempt for each other. Compassion, I think, is a, is a big element of a flourishing community. What else? Right. What's that? Acceptance. Acceptance. Like learning to accept others as God accepts us. You can't work with people if you don't accept uh, people. And acceptance doesn't always mean agreement, right? Right in the back. Supporting each other. other. But what if they're a Coug fan? Yeah. So (laughs) conditional support, right? That's the the requirement for a flourishing community. (laughs) What else? Love, yeah, that's uh, too soft. We won't worry about that one. Yeah, of course, love. Love, we gotta learn to love one another. What else? Giving of yourself. Giving of yourself. I think that would be a, a really good definition of what we mean by love, like learning to give of ourselves by serving and empowering others. That is phenomenal. One or two others, right here. Taking care of the vulnerable. Like caring for people who who might not have what you have or might not have the safety and protection that you and I might have? Yeah. Uh, Accountability. Yeah, accountability. Um, Accountability, why would that be important? Anybody. (laughs) I was asking your husband. (laughs) No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) He's really quiet right now. Uh, Why would accountability be important to a, a community that's transforming? You can't promise something and not do it? You can't, but you shouldn't. Why shouldn't you? Relationships are built on trust. When you aren't accountable for your commitments, does that build or break trust? Breaks it, right? I mean, that's fundamental. I'm so glad you, you, you mentioned that. Um, what, what I want to do is I want to um, start at the beginning of Scripture, give just a, a, a brief framework um, Start at the beginning, look at the end, and then I'm going to give us a picture uh, that God gives us from the scriptures of what a community could look like, what his heart is for the community. So let me just kind of step away um, from this conversation. Hey, keep it in your minds for a second. We're going to come back to it. This is really good stuff. Um, if, you, if you wouldn't mind, here's the, here's the um, kind of our passion statement at Whitewater. We are sent into a broken world. How many of you guys would agree that there's brokenness in the world? This, the world is, is wonderful and good, but it's, there's brokenness. We're sent into the world by God to bring the whole person and the whole community into a flourishing life with God. So God cares about the flourishing of individuals and communities. Can we agree on that? All right, let's move to the, this, what I would call just a theological framework to help us think about this. In the beginning, it says in Genesis chapter 1, I think that's a good place to start, if we want to know what a flourishing community looks like, what God wants Pierce County's communities to look like, um, Genesis 1 gives us a good starting point. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the whole chapter talks about how God created everything in the heavens and the earth, everything that's visible, everything that's invisible. We learn from Romans 1, everything that's created. And sometimes, like, we don't realize this, but the invisible things are often the most important things. You're thinking, like, what? That thought you had is invisible. I couldn't see it, but it was important. The, th- the thoughts, your imagination, your love, your joy, uh, those things are invisible aspects of who you are and they're often the most important. Everything was created by God in Genesis 1. 
At the end of chapter one, it says in verse 31, then God looked over all of the creation he had made and he saw that it was very good. All the plant life, the animal life, humans, everything he created was, he declared good. It was blessed. The garden was blessed. Now, when we, when we look at Genesis 1 and 2, I'm going to summarize this, but we see two really important things. That the reason that humans were created, two really big reasons that we can get and summarize from the Genesis account, from the ancient narrative, is one is that we were created to walk with God. Like have a relationship with God. Know God, love God, and, and to, to, to be have an expanding and expansive knowledge of our surroundings and our world and to learn from him that we are like God's kids. You and I are the beloved children of God and we're to walk with him. The second thing that we see in the crea- creation story, the, uh, this, the Christian and Jewish tradition, our origin story, is not only walking with God, but working with God. Not working on our own, not letting God just do all the work, working with God together. And it, it, we're placed in this garden. Adam and Eve, the humankind, is cre- they're created and placed in this garden, this place of beauty. And, and God puts them in this wild and woolly place to work with him to bring order into the organic not like to, like to dominate and destroy the organic, nor to let the organic overwhelm what God's order is, but like this beautiful merging of order and organization in um, the organic. My grandpa was a gardener. God it teaches us as a gardener, and he's teaching us to garden in this world. And it's interesting, when my grandpa was a gardener, he would have like roses over in this part, and the germs, snapdragons. I remember he organized this whole thing, and he had a little path that went through. He loved having his hands in the earth. He loved it. And there was just something good about um, his work. And we were designed to walk with and work with God. And, there, and when my grandpa was doing gardening, there was one story we learned that he was cutting back some paracanthas and the dust from them and the whatever the, the paracantha like um, uh, juice got on his hands and he started wiping his brows. And if you know anything about that plant, that's poisonous. And when he was sweating, it says in Southern California, it got into his eyes. And he said he had never been in so much pain in his life. He just he couldn't see anything. They had to rush him to the hospital. He thought he was going to be blind for life. And they just flushed and flushed out his eyes over and over till they cleared it out. And like it was the worst moment. The, the garden in that moment was lost. The beauty was lost. And, and in the narrative of Genesis, we see that humankind were given this beautiful garden to work with God, walk with God, but they were given the ability to choose and to grow and they chose to turn away from God, disobey him. Many of you guys know this story and to keep it brief, they, they disobeyed God, turned away from him and the result was like really, really quick. The garden was blessed and then when they disobeyed and turned away, the garden was broken and lost. In Genesis 3, 8 through 10, it says, when the cool of the evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden. And so they hid from the Lord God among the trees. And they hadn't been walking with God and having the, a, a wonderful relationship, but something was broken all of a sudden. And, and all of a sudden, they hide. They heard God, and so they hid among the trees. And then the Lord God called to the man, who are you? Or where are you? And he replied, I heard you walking in the garden, which was normal for them. Like there was this just pure, great relationship. But now when he hears God walking in the garden, he says, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. I don't think that's just referring physically. I think there was all of a sudden a spiritual awareness and he had sinned and he had done the wrong thing. And remember we talked about living honestly before God? What, what happens when sin enters the equation? Brokenness enters the equation. They don't live honestly. They try to hide who they are and what they've done. And you can just see this moment where God's like, are you kidding me? You know, my, my friend Ryan Jensma, he was my youth pastor. I've had him preach here. Um, he was, um, kids are having a blast up there, by the way. I love it. Um, 
But my friend, he was, um, he was my youth pastor, and he told me when I was living in Bellingham as a high schooler and middle schooler, he used to tell these stories about this weird little town he grew up in called Puyallup. And I'd never been there, but he told this one story where he would every summer earn money picking berries because there was a lot of like berry picking farms. Uh, did any of you guys grow up picking berries in this area? Oh, there's a few of you. That's awesome. So he was picking berries, and he remembers, um, and, and this is the best I can remember the story, but he remembers they were picking berries and grabbing raspberries, and they're throwing them in buckets, and his friend Guido, I don't know why he had a friend named Guido, um, grabbed a really ripe raspberry and threw it and hit Ryan right in the shirt. It was a new shirt, nice shirt, and it had a big stain on it. He was like, are you kidding me? Grabbed a berry, and what do you do when you're in high school, middle school? He chucked one at his friend. Guido ducked, boom, it hits another kid. Then all of a sudden, that kid's like, what are you doing? And he throws, and it hits another kid. And all of a sudden, a big berry fight breaks out, started by my, who's a pastor now, a wicked, wicked pastor. Like, all of a sudden, this fight breaks out in the middle of this garden, in the middle of this berry farm. And, uh, and do you think the, the, the berry farmer is happy about this? Let me add to this. Um, I guess there was a, 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 a pit that was made for all of the bio grossness of this farm. So all the, the rotten bad berries, because they'd been evil and wrong, they were thrown into this pit. No, they, they were rotting and mildew, and so they threw that. And any kind of um, bio grossness was thrown in here. Uh, well, Ryan, I think, pushed one of his friends, and I think it might have been Guido. And then someone pushed him from behind, and all these kids fell into this pit and this mess, and it's just foul. And you can just imagine the farmer coming out, the berry farmer, seeing the world, his world, his, what he had designed to be beautiful and to make money and to be good, and, and all this beauty broken in front of him and he's just like stop and he's just yelling at kids, you out you out and he's you know these kids from the pit are like help us you know and he's pulling these kids out they're just disgusting and I imagine God looking at this garden he's given us everything given Adam and Eve everything and just like are you kidding me looking when we learn father's spirit son right and he's looking over the spirit are you seeing this can you believe this? He's like, I just, I just want to punch them in the face right now. The spirit looking at, you know, the father saying, no, don't do that. That would destroy their souls, literally. Do not do that. And, and God having the patience. So what happens? It says in verse 23, so God, the Lord God banished them from the Garden of Eden. Banished them from the Garden of Eden. Um, now, the garden was blessed. It was broken and lost. And then when we look, if we were to skip to the end chapters in Revelation, what God ultimately wants to see done, our God's a restoring God. Check this out. In the Revelation, the garden um, is restored into a garden city or a garden community. In Revelations 21, 1 through 3, it says, Then I saw, this is John the writer, says, I saw a new heaven and new earth. For the old heaven and old earth had disappeared, and there's this renewal, and the sea was also gone. And check this out, verse 2, And I saw the holy city. He saw a new city. And in Revelation, it talks about the tree of life is there in this new city. The same tree of life that was in the garden. And, and this, uh, in this city, in this community, of God, there's a tree of life that has leaves that are for the healing of the nations, and there's a river that flows out of it, and there's life, and so this garden city is restored from the garden that was lost. You guys see it? Does God care about people? Does God care about our communities and our cities? So if we were designed to walk with and work with God, do you think it's possible that that? What God wants to do in and through our life, in our skills and our brokenness and in the blessings that he's given us, God is wanting to work toward this garden city. What would it look like in your life and my life, in the life of our church, if we understood this picture so well that we were actively working with God? Well, he was just checking. He's like, okay, you've got 10 minutes, George. Close this thing down. What would it look like if we as a community understood God's heart for our community and worked with him? And there's a tension in the New Testament. You see people that are like, oh, the world's broken and lost and it should just go to hell in a handbasket, so let's let it go to hell in a handbasket and just teach the word at people. 
but not actively work for the good of our communities. Then there's some people who are like, we just need to work and do and do, and we will change our communities, and we will do it all ourselves. And when you read the New Testament, there's like a tension that the writers, and even Jesus' teaching, even his disciples, where it's like, yeah, the world is broken, and until God renews everything, it's not gonna be perfect, but we should be leaning toward of uh, bringing a flourishing, blessed community in our lives. Does that make sense? So we, as a community, are kind of like caught in this tension. Where we know it's broken, but we are, come, we are sent to bless and help the, the communities around us transform. So, question still stands. What does God want the communities in Pierce County to look like? Could I just take you to a passage? We'll just take a few minutes to look at this. I'm going to give you some of the excavation that our leadership team did um, through this passage. And this is found in Isaiah 65. And I, I want you guys to, to, to read this with me and be thinking as we're reading, what does this passage mean for us today? Because I think this is giving us a picture of what God wants our communities to look like now what we're to be working toward together now. Not on our own, but with God. If we're like Adam and Eve, we're to be working with God towards this. So, here we go. What what does God want our communities in Pierce County to look like? Verse 17 of um, Isaiah 65 says, Look, I'm creating a new heavens and a new earth. Remember the Revelation um, story we were looking at? I'm, I'm creating a new heavens and a new earth. And no one will even think about the old ones anymore. Be glad, rejoice forever in my creation. It says in verse 18, look, I will will create Jerusalem as a place of happiness. That's the the garden city, the garden community we were talking about. Um, The place where God's order meets the organic nature of of God's creation. Um, Look, I will create a, a Jerusalem as a place of happiness. Her people will be a source of joy. I will rejoice over Jerusalem and delight in my people. And the sound of weeping and crying will be heard in it no more. So there, there will be a public joy and happiness. That's the first thing. If you have your notes, there will be public joy and happiness. This is what our leadership talked about. I mean, you see it right here. We, how many of you guys have noticed that our world really can focus on the brokenness and what's wrong, what's negative, what's evil? And sometimes we'll, I think we follow what we focus on. And how many of you have noticed or been impacted by people that are struggling with depression, um, being pulled in, in, whether it's chemical or there's awful things that have happened in life? I mean, I've, I've had friends in the last few months, multiple friends, text me or call me or get coffee with me that are impacted by depression and even friends and family members who are struggling with suicidal thoughts and even actions. And God wants us to be people who are helping our communities have a, be a place of joy and happiness. How many of you guys can get behind that? Say amen with me. Amen. amen. Verse 20, no longer will um, babies die when only a few days old. No longer will adults die before they uh, have lived a full life. No longer will people be considered old at 100, but only the cursed will, will die that young. It's, it's saying like the, the, there's this longevity in health. And if you'd underlined in verse 20, lo, no longer will babies die. And under that, no longer will adults die. And so the, one, the thing we talked about is there will be health care, well-being, and value for children and the elderly. So it's, you, some of you guys already mentioned this, caring for the vulnerable. But children will have clear value in our, in our society, in our communities, and in our hearts. And it starts with us. And Christians, um, are, are unborn children valuable? Absolutely. Are born children value, valuable? And sometimes there's a disconnect in the Christian community. And I'm saying, we got to put this together. The children, life is valuable, whether it's unborn or born. And as a church community, we have to put our resources toward both. Amen? And the elderly, 
There's like all life matters. We are spiritual beings created in the image of God to walk with God and work with God. And that means life is valuable. And, we, and healthcare, well-being, and value needs to be there. That's what we're working with God toward. Verse 21, in those days, people will live in, their, in houses that they build and eat the fruit of their own vineyards, of their own work. Unlike the past, invaders will not come and take their houses and confiscate their vineyards. Like many people live in a world of scarcity and it's going to be taken away. And the world that we're working with God toward is a world of generosity and abundance and it's not scarce. We don't have to be afraid. And I love it. Underline, the people will live in the houses they build and eat the fruit of their own vineyards. Third thing we discovered as as a leadership community is everyone will have access and ability to provide homes and food. I I love that they will have access and ability. So God's not just looking to give a hand out all the time. He wants to give a hand up. Someone talked about accountability. We talk about helping people with life skills. There's a reality here that the scriptures are teaching that God wants us to enjoy the fruit of our work. And learn to be skilled, learn to be able to provide. But for those of us who aren't able or don't have the skills or don't have the ability that we as a community, we don't leave people behind. That the vulnerable matter to us. And as we're training, we're also serving people. So everyone will have access and ability to provide homes and food for themselves. For my people will live as long as trees and my chosen ones will have time to enjoy their hard-won gains. Isn't that cool? Like you'll be able to enjoy the work of your hands in the kingdom of God that we get to look forward to. It's not like gonna be nothing and we're on, you know, clouds with harps, but there's like work to be done and it's good work, creative work. Unlike the past, invader, oh, excuse me, I'll go back to 23. They will not work in vain and their children will not be doomed to, mis- to misfortune. This is going back to the garden story that we are designed to walk with and work with God. Everyone, this is the, the fourth discovery, everyone will have long lives and strong lives. Everyone will have long lives and strong lives. For they are people blessed by the Lord, and their children too will be blessed. Fifth discovery was every family will live life under the complete blessing of God. Can you imagine that? Every family having systems of support, every family, every man, woman, and child, and any of their descendants, their kids, their grandkids, are under the active blessing of God. I just think that's so... So amazing, you see a little bit more of that spelled out in verse 24. I will answer them before they even call to me. Uh, While they are still talking about their needs, I will go ahead and answer their prayers. That means before our our prayers even go up, God's, uh, his work has come down. And he's answering our prayers before we even pray. There's an active blessing of God. That's what we're to be doing in the community and living out in faith in our communities. Verse 25, this is really interesting. The wolf and the lamb will feed together. The lion will eat hay like a cow, but the snakes will eat the dust. It's interesting, like this this image, like we were talking about as a community, uh, you know, there's there's a lot of thoughts on this one. I recently, uh, actually yesterday, I was at a reindeer farm with these animals. There were reindeer and uh, there were, um, what's the other ones? Reindeer and caribou. And they can co-mingle and, um, I was learning all these interesting things. Like at three, three days old, at the, on the third day, they've grown so much that they're, they are fast, they're faster than the fastest human being on the planet. Like because they have, to, they have to grow quickly in their environment with wolves and all the prey that are coming after them. And I thought that was interesting. They are, um, they're mammals that can survive the coldest of temperatures on earth. Um, just the way they're built is really fascinating. They can see ultraviolet light. Do you guys know that about caribou? They're like the, one of the only mammals that can see ultraviolet light. That means they can see the lichen, the food that they need to eat to survive. They can see um, fur in ultraviolet light so they can see you know, wolves and other prey around them. They can see urine. I thought that was interesting. Most of the crowd was like, ugh, gross. But I was like, this stage of life with a two-year-old, do you know how helpful that would be <laughs> if I could? I don't know if that had anything to do with this sermon, but um, the wolf and the lamb. In those days, no one will be hurt or destroyed on my holy mountain. I, the Lord, have spoken. And and here's the sixth thing we discovered. There will be an absence of violence and predatory behavior. 
there will be an absence of violence and predatory behavior. There's, someone also mentioned, well, there's these different animals, there's a diversity, and, there, and God's a diverse God, and their community's going to have diversity. It's not going to have the violence. It's not going to have predatory behavior. And that, friends, is what God wants our communities to look like. Do you believe it? Do you want to work with God toward this? I sure do. And the beautiful thing is God is transforming us individually, but as he's doing that, God has called us into a world of work and into a world of, uh, of, of our communities where he's wanting to transform them, help them flourish through you and through me. Our whole series, well, the, the title of our series is Called to Compassion. And I want to invite you to come back next week and start the, the, the journey of, of what does it look like to, to embrace your calling by God, your specific gifts, your passions, your future that God wants to use to bless our world. And all of us are called into a certain world. There's a, there's a verse in John 20. I just want to leave us with this, this thought. In John uh, chapter 20, verse 21, Jesus says, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Jesus was sent into our world to change our world to serve our world, to sacrifice for you, Each one of us has a specific world that God has called us into, like the world, sure, but each of you is called into a world or a few different worlds that God wants you to have a transforming, and he wants you to be sent like Jesus into. So let me just read this to you. Um, as we're closing today, I just, this is the thought I wanted to close on. Each one of us has a calling in our life. We're called to a world that God wants to transform. And like, you're the only one who can be you. And God wants to use you. Not me, not someone else, you in your world. So let me ask you, how many people are called to the, the world of healthcare in here? We got some healthcare, thank, you know, praise God. How many people are called to the world of business? Working in or owning? We got, we got business people. Sometimes there's crossover here, right? Um, how about the world of civic service? Policemen, firemen, you know, judges, justices, politicians, military. Thank you. I mean, this is, this is, God has called us to these places, sometimes seasonally, sometimes for life. How about, how about art, the world of art? Any artists in here? We got a few. Some of them left the whole service and came up last service and started playing. We got artists. How about craftsmanship? People who are builders and crafts things with their hands. How many builders are in here called to the world of craft? You guys have been geared and designed for that. How about the world of family, building your homes? We got some, yes. I mean, like sometimes people, that's not, that, that isn't um, lifted up enough in our community. People who are building the homes or working with our kids and changing our, our families, that is so important. Uh, lastly, how about this one, uh, the world of education? Yeah, we, we got some ed- educators investing in the next generation. Um, what if we were sent into these world, worlds by God together as a community to help God bring flourishing to those areas? And it's not like what you're doing in the week is less important than here on Sunday. It's as important. And I want you guys to know that you are in a church that wants to support your calling by God. We want to support you. We want to serve you. I've had mentors in my life, like Lowell Baki, he's here. Other guys who have poured into me, they want to serve my calling. I want to serve yours. I want our church. And I want you to know you have a church that's behind you to be agents of transformation. Amen? So, let me pray, and we're going to worship together. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would help us as a church to begin to see our world as a calling and a place of transformation not something we need to be afraid of, not something that we need to be separate from, not something that we need to accept fully, but something that does have brokenness, that does need change. But would you use our church to transform this world? In Jesus' name, amen.